is in a new position at OIT. Her title is Universal Design Consultant, Identity yeah. Consultant. Mm -hmm. And uh, she is um, going to tell you all about what C went through over the past year or so, and what the university has done to face the issues, and what we need to do as instructors to be compliant mm -hmm. with um, the new policy that I hear is now published, right? It is, yes, it uh, is live. Hasn't been officially announced. Mm -hmm. oh. Are okay. levels okay in terms of the sound? Are you picking me up all right? Perfect. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, we go to sleep already. Okay. All right. So, as a huge just we're here to talk about accessibility and best principles for universal design. My name is Elena Beaver. Um, I am the Universal Instructional Design Consultant at OIT. This is a brand new position, and I will tell you a little bit more about it as we go on. Um, so just a little preview of what we have to look forward to. I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of context and um, background about the Department of Justice Investigation. So, um, have, have you heard of it before, Department of Justice Investigation? Um, yeah, so I've found this to be true, <laughs> um, that not a lot of people have heard about the Department of Justice Investigation. Um, I'm entrenched in this world, and so to me it was very public, very, you know, um, part of what I knew about, but despite being announced from the chancellor, it went out in university communications, um, the news picked it up, um, not a whole lot of people know about it. So we're going to talk more about what it is, what it means, and what the implications of that are. Um, and then we're going to kind of use that as a jumping off point to talk about universal design and what the theory of universal design is. Um, and then the bulk of this workshop is actually hopefully hands-on. We're going to do some application of universal design. We have a syllabus workshop. So if you have a syllabus that you can bring up in your computer, that would be great. I would love for us to be able to talk about those and um, discuss and look at some examples of what a universally designed syllabus means. And um, then we're going to look at some other applications of universal design in terms of making other course materials accessible. And I'll kind of leave you with some resources, and then we can have, you know, hopefully a few more minutes at the end for some questions, answers, discussion, um, anything else that might be on your minds. Okay. So, the Department of Justice letter. Um, so this is a thing that's been happening for over a year now at C. Boulder. Basically, um, under uh, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, C. Boulder was dinged. We got reported for inaccessibility problems on campus. Um, the uh, suit was raised by students who are blind so it was on behalf of um, low vision and blind students on this campus. And in particular, one of the things that was a little bit of a tipping point was, for example, all of the beautiful flat screen signs that you see going up around campus. You walk into an academic building, and there's a flat screen TV that has various announcements. There's one out here in your hallway. Um, really useful for sighted individuals. You can use it like a map and find out where you need to go in the, in the um, building. You can use it as a place for announcements. But if you're not sighted, you walk up and <laughs> there's how do you find that information? Can you touch it? Does it speak to you? Like, no, none of that was happening. Um, if you're conscious about it, you know, you can try to find other ways to make that accessible. But, um, as it is right now, you know, there was no way for unsighted people to get that information. So that was just one of several things. And then, like any good problem, you start peeling back the layers and it just turns into an onion, right? There's all sorts of things on campus that weren't really accessible. Um, people were having problems with portals, with registering for classes, with um, accessing all sorts of just basic university functionality. 
um, issues in D2L, issues with um, um, uh, like MyCU info and stuff. There were just bugs, things that could work better. Um, and so it set off a bunch of alarms, right? The chancellor on down, people say, whoa, we are under a federal investigation. This is serious news. Um, and it, indeed, it became news. Uh, the Daily Camera picked it up as a story, and suddenly CU Boulder is in the spotlight um, for something that is not so positive. Um, so it was a big deal. People put, a, put together a plan right away. So um, the Information and Communications Technologies Accessibility Initiative, it's kind of a mouthful, but um, ICT is what it's called in shorthand. The ICT Accessibility uh, Initiative uh, was comprised of several committees of people. Um, so co coalitions formed from members, high stakeholders across campus, um, faculty representation, as well as administrative representation around campus. And people started breaking this into smaller components. Like, what's our plan? What are we going to do? Um, and so alliances with disability services, with OIT, people out of the chancellor's office, um, faculty representation, people were all getting together trying to unpack this, this issue, this problem. And they began sending updates to the Department of Justice, saying, okay, we're working on it, here's what we're doing. Um, Department of Justice, turns out, they're not a very communicative unit. They're not like sending us heartfelt letters in response to our, our memos and our updates. Um, so it was kind of a welcome surprise when all of a sudden this past May um, we got a notification that officially the suit was dropped. That doesn't happen very often. We're actually pretty proud of that happening. Um, what that means is that um, what that means is that basically we're making good progress. Everything that we've put in place, we're we're kind of showing and proving to the Department of Justice that we're headed in the right direction. They're satisfied enough that they dropped the official investigation, but um, you know now we have everyone's attention. We have all of these things, all of these balls are in the air, everything's rolling and moving forward, so we're continuing with that momentum. Um, at uh, the AHEAD conference, which is the Association um, in Higher Education um, and Disability Conference, uh, we did a presentation around our Department of Justice um, inquiry and the way that CU handled it, and we overwhelmingly got feedback that, oh, CU Boulder is setting the standard for how one deals with this. Not many major R1 universities have had these suits, but it was kind of like the writing was on the wall. The implication is that it could happen at any major university and that the, the problem is pretty widespread that nobody's perfectly accessible, that these issues are happening everywhere, and it's just a matter of who, who has students that raise the alarm, that bring up the issue, because it was a student-led complaint. So if other institutions have students who have disabilities who are unhappy, they could bring a similar spotlight onto that institution. So CU Boulder is actually now, in the good work that we're doing with this, helping to set the standard for how to do it right, how to do it well. So we're kind of taking what was initially a cause for alarm and a lot of anxiety, and we're turning it into a positive by once again becoming um, a national and world leader, we hope, in accessibility. So that's where we're headed. That's where you know the chancellor's vision wants to take us. Um, so there is an accessibility policy. It is published on the accessibility website, which I will show you um, in a little bit here. So if you're interested, you can go in and read it. Um, it hasn't received a whole lot of publicity yet, but uh, for those of you who might be watching this later, um, it probably has gone out. It's going to be um, announced uh, as official campus-wide communication sometime mid-October, but part of the implications <coughs> for this is that we need to have training for um, the OIT staff so that all of our undergraduate students who are answering the phones and 
you know, handling all of the initial communication so that they know what to do with an influx of people saying, ah, accessibility, what do we do? Um, we need to make sure that our staff are prepared for that. So we're, we have some upcoming training and that's the only reason really why there's that delay. Um, but otherwise, it is technically public and approved. Um, and for me, in my role, um, this my role was created to um, be a support to faculty and staff on issues of accessibility. And my background is in education. So I'm finishing my doctorate here at CU Boulder um, in literacy education and curriculum design. Um, I do a lot of faculty outreach and a lot with universal design as part of my background and my, my doctoral work. Um, and so I come at this from a very sort of personal place in social justice as a former educator um, at the high school level and now in, uh, at CU. I've been teaching writing here for the past eight years um, as a graduate student. So. I have a, a deep history of being um, in the classroom, so I can empathize <laughs> with where you're coming from, because in my heart of hearts, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator as well. Um, before I you know, started this new life as an as a IT professional. Um, and it brings me back to um, interactions with students. And so this is a student that I've worked with um, on and off for the past three years. Um, her name's Christy. She lives here in Boulder. She's actually a high school student. And um, I got to know her through just sort of a side grad school moonlighting gig of being an accessible, or being a uh, academic coach, sorry, um, literacy tutor and academic coach. And, um, you know, she is a bright girl. She speaks French. She is in the mountain biking club. Um, she has all of these big goals and dreams for what she wants to do. She's in, starting her senior year right now um, here in Boulder at a local high school. Um, but she also is extremely dyslexic um, to the point where her form of dyslexia, she benefits from actually having some sort of screen reader to help her navigate and focus on text because it's so time consuming for her to just read a web page, read email post things, read things. Um, so in a digital environment, and high school is so digital these days, students are all doing things on Google Drive. <laughs> I mean, that's just sort of the standard of what a lot of students are experiencing right now in K through 12. Um, it just became really, really difficult for her to be able to do her work. But looking at Christy, you wouldn't know that. And so for me, it really emphasizes this very human element of um, disability as a social construct, right? That what we perceive as normal is socially constructed. And um, what we perceive as disability is socially constructed. The truth is, biologically, there's a ton of variation. And that diversity is good. That's what makes our species a healthy species. That's what make, makes our communities healthy communities. So if you think about social interaction at a university setting, we want a diversity of thinkers. But that means diversity in terms of how we learn, how we think, how we process information. Um, and so sometimes we have to plan for that diversity rather than, you know, at the institutional level, the stereotype remains that, you know, you come in and you have one particular way of getting your information, you know, it's that that idea that we're all on the factory line and we get our, our little bits of information and then we're supposed to be able to spit that information out, get our piece of paper and move out into society. Um, and that doesn't work for everyone. We already know that, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the, the big mechanics of the institution have changed. Um, so, knowing this and knowing that disability and accessibility have become issues on this campus, my role is to help bridge that gap. How do you take this reality of the diverse learners that are in our society, and how do you plan for that when it comes to curriculum design? Um, it's actually not as hard as you might think, 
And as a longtime educator myself, personally, I just think it, it's just good teaching. <laughs> it just sounds like good teaching to me. Um, so uh, universal design. How many of you have heard of that as a theory or somewhat familiar? So universal design is um, basically, it's a theoretical framework for all learners. It's kind of what I was talking about, that rather than just planning for, you know, your, um, your normal student who can come in, read a chapter out of a book, concentrate on it, take a bubble standardized test, and get an A, you know, that's sort of the out-of-the-box assumed student that a lot of our systems have prepared us to expect. And that's just not the reality when it comes to students who are the students in our classes, who are on this campus. Um, part of the statistic that we deal with at this university and, and across the country is that of every four students who receive some sort of support in their high school for a cognitive learning disability like Christie's, um, only one of those students chooses to identify themselves in college, if they even get to college. But um, so that means for every four kids who have an IEP, right, who like documented disability at the high school level, only one of them chooses to come forward and get help with disability services. So disability services is a wonderful resource and they do excellent work in supporting students, but they can only do that if the students choose to identify themselves and come to them. So that means, you know, we have up to 75% more students there aren't three disability services who might have cognitive impairments of some level. It's a really messy catch-all term, right? It could mean dyslexia to um, students who are epileptic um, to students who are on the autism spectrum somewhere. I mean, all of that is considered um, cognitive learning disability. Um, so a lot of those students are unidentified and in your classes and <laughs> maybe late in turning in work chronically. And, you know, they may not have a clear understanding of what their issue is or what's wrong with them. Like, you know, students are at sort of different places in their own journey. Some are really self-aware and know how to self-advocate and know what options are open to them. And others just aren't <laughs> really have kind of a, you know, a kind of a low self-awareness um, when it comes to reflecting on how they learn best and how to get the resources that they need to succeed. Um, so, you know, knowing that that's our population, that that's the situation that we live in and have been living in, but maybe just have not been super aware of all of this time, universal design is a theory that helps us kind of take that into consideration whenever we're building something new. Universal design has been around for a long time. It actually started back in the, oh, 60s maybe, um, with architecture became widely used as an architectural concept. Um, and when you think about accessibility, buildings changed sort of first in a lot of ways. You know, we suddenly had ramps appearing leading up to buildings starting in like the 80s and the 90s. Um, there was this wider recognition of, wow, we kind of build our society in a really unfriendly way to people who may be mobility impaired or non-sighted or non-hearing. And it was sort of this like, oh, duh, like maybe we could do a few easy things that could make life easier for a large number of Americans. Um, accessibility is important because disability, disability impacts all of us at some point in our lives. I mean, if anyone has had a loved one who has grown old and not been able to be as spry as they once were, you know that Disability is something we will all eventually experience if we live into our natural lifespan. Um, and so, not to get all like dire on you, but it's, it's kind of a, a, a true reality that it's not just an othering experience. It's an experience that um, unites us as people because it's something everybody can relate to. Um, it's not like the other isms. Ableism is something that can affect you across um, a variety of other factors in your life. Um, so universal design, um, as it's applied to education, that started happening in the 90s, really. Um, it, uh, it's an 
educational theory that designs for a broad range of learners right from the start so that um, people who identify as having disabilities can benefit from the way that the course is, de is designed as well as everyone else. <laughs> so that's the beauty of it is that it's just supposed to be beautiful and elegant and useful for everyone. It doesn't require that you have a special accommodation and say, oh, well, I have a blind person in the room. What do I do? Oh, um, let's have you go over here and do this other thing instead. No, that's, that's not what you're supposed to do. I mean, if you're blind, you feel othered enough in the society as it is. You know, hopefully a classroom is one place that you can go and feel welcome. Um, so that's the idea. Um, Universal design in this iteration and how we're practicing it at CU is proactive. I mean, it's it's a proactive theory to begin with, but we're really emphasizing that here at this institution, that we want to be proactive. That's why I spoke with that region. I'm here talking to you all. I mean, we're not waiting for you to all suddenly come upon it someday and realize, wait, what? What am I supposed to, huh? What's this? You know, it's not a reactive thing. I'm here trying to you know, get people to have access to this information um, early on so that you can, you know, make some simple changes um, and so that it doesn't seem overwhelming. That's the goal. Um, and so, yeah, the idea is that people go beyond legal compliance. Um, there are tons of resources about universal design. I'm going to kind of show you the seven principles. Um, and then we're not going to spend a whole lot more time on it because um, nobody likes to just be lectured to about theory. <laughs> and honestly, this stuff is most powerful when you can actually apply it. So that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. But I have tons of resources. Um, it is an academic field. People do use this for their theoretical frameworks and their scholarship. Um, there's a really robust history of universal design applied to specific um, uh, subject areas, so if you're interested in that side, then you can talk to me later and I can get you more information, or you can just Google it because it's, it's not hiding, it's there if you look for it. Um, but yeah, so the seven principles of universal design, um, equitable, easily usable by all people, flexible, it's um, able to be used flexibly, um, so you know, um, you can kind of both participate and present in flexible ways. There's not just only one way that something needs to happen. Simple and intuitive, things are consistent, they're usable, um, and things make sense. You know, something that looks like a button, if you click it, oh, it, it is a button, good, okay, yeah, it's that kind of thing. Um, perceptible information, things are explicit, they're readily perceived, Things aren't in contrasting colors and or like two shades of blue that are right next to each other. You're supposed to be able to read that text. Now things are easily laid out. They're readily perceived. Tolerance for error. Things that are supportive rather, rather than punitive in the environment. So like filling out an online form that says, hey, you forgot to fill in your phone number before it lets you proceed all the way to the end of the form and then alerts you that there's a problem and makes you read you the whole form from the beginning. Um, that's a usability choice that is universally designed, you know, it lets you know, hey, don't forget to do this thing before you move on because it would really suck if you get to the end and try to submit your application for this one thing that you did one thing wrong and now the whole thing is worthless, right? Um, things used to be that way and enough people got angry that the design changed. Um, low physical effort, minimizing unnecessary physical effort for, um, what people need to do to be able to participate, um, and space for use, um, whether digital space or physical space, but um, that things are contextually appropriate for what it is you're trying to do. Um, that's one that I like to think of and kind of apply to all of them. Universal design is best when you think about it in terms of context. Um, it's kind of kind of a misnomer in some ways, like things are never going to be perfectly when accessible for everybody 100% of the time. You're never going to fully get there. But with universal design, you can get almost all the way there, and then you're, you're ready if somebody does need a specific accommodation. So um, 
yeah, we can talk about that a little bit, but I don't want to let you think that universal design means like, it will take care of everything, it's a magic wand, and <laughs> now it's just done. Um, no, that's, you know, but if you have a particular learning goal, then you can design around that learning goal so that things are universally designed in getting to that kind of outcome. That's where it makes sense, right? So, you know, you're never going to be able to have a dance class in which someone who is a wheelchair user is able to fully do every single thing that persons who don't need to be in wheelchairs are able to do. So, you know, we still live within the realm, the realm of reality here. Um, my power saving mode is just too efficient. Okay. When I talk about universal design, one of the things I like to do is to kind of create a metaphor so that it kind of sinks in pretty quick. Um, so how many of you have seen this door before on campus? Yeah, this is the door um, by the Lapping Boat to get into Norland Library. And I love this door because I love the library and I love coffee. So it's, it's a popular one for me. I love this door. But this is also a perfect example of universal design. So what about this door makes it usable by anyone? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You push a button and the doors will open automatically for you. There are yeah. no stairs? There are no stairs, yes. There's a smooth, even ground approach to get into this building. Yeah, what else? What if you're blind? If you are blind, then there are certain conventions of buildings that you can know to go to one side or the other. Actually, it's not perfect, because if it were, actually that little button would be on the other side because it makes more sense. People typically go to the right mm -hmm. to enter doorways. Um, probably what that means to me is that it cost X number of thousands of dollars more to run an extra cable under the ground and to bring the button up to the other side. And so somebody cut a corner and decided to just keep it over there. Um, but yeah, uh, it's a, not a wider than standard doorway. So if you're a wheelchair user, you can easily get in to the doorway without scraping your knuckles on the edges of the door frame. Um, it's also a taller than standard doorway, which is useful if you're carrying some really large, beautiful plant or something, and you need to enter a building carrying something really big and awkward. So you could be um, blind, you could be a wheelchair user, you could be three years old and not physically able to hoist the door open. You could be 93 years old and require the use of a walker to enter the building. Um, you could be pushing a stroller. You could be pushing a stroller. You could be a new mother and not be able to, you know, navigate a set of clunky stairs with a stroller and your infant in your arms or asleep in the stroller. Um, I'm a new mom as of this year, so I've reached, uh, and I have talked about that as a reality for, for parents, you know, that, um, that this is a feature that you might not have thought about before. Um, yeah, you could be a really robust, healthy person, but just be carrying something large and awkward and be able to enter the building with a minimum of effort. And so, beautiful, wonderful, um, aesthetically. Not bad, right? It actually looks pretty good, too, um, if I do say so myself. So knowing that that door is universally designed, when we look at a door like this one, again, not far from here, just right, right across the fountain, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's happening with this doorway that makes it unfriendly. Um, there's a sign. Yeah, so that's okay. Just circumnavigate this entire building in your wheelchair before you're going to be able to enter this building. No problem. Um, that's called an accommodation right there. You know, like we've made it possible for you to get into this building, but it's not an equity issue, right? It's you're not going to be able to enter with the same ease of use that other users 
would expect to experience. Um, so it's a nod in the right direction, but it's not ideal. I mean, we have four stairs, actually. Um, if you have more than three, you're supposed to have a handrail, actually. Um, so that's a building code issue. That's a building code violation. Um, the doorways are standard width, right? Um, they all require that you hoist them open. There's no button. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a product of an older time of design. And it's not universally accessible. Um, so now, if we were to take these two doors and hold them in your mind's eye, and then turn them into metaphors for education. Some people say, well, you know, I, I believe in equal education. I give everybody the same key. Everybody has a key to the door. So I've covered my bases, right? Everybody has a key to the door. Well, not everybody can get to the door to use the key. It's worthless. So if your course is a door, which one are you going to build? <laughs> so this comes back to the idea of equality versus equity, right? And I love this image because in half a second, you can get what it's trying to say. But it's not enough to just give everyone the same key. You have to change the door. And then everybody will be able to learn. OK. So it's not about ideas. It's about making ideas happen. We try to put this into practice. It's an active theory. It's something that's lived. It's growing. And when it comes to the accessibility policy, what people at the university level are going to want to see is that you are making a good faith effort to implementing this into your courses. No one expects this to happen overnight. <laughs> it, it would be completely overwhelming. Um, so, you know, don't worry about it being hours and hours of work or like, oh gosh, you know, I have all of these inaccessible PDFs that I use in my class. What do I do with all of that? Ah, take a breath. It's okay. We're going to focus on skills that will help with new things that you create. So as you're implementing new stuff into your courses, planning for next semester, planning for something you might add into your class this semester, try a couple of these things. That's what we ask. We're building for the future. So that's the idea. Um, helps to take a little bit of the pressure off. And then slowly, you know, as, the, as time goes by, you know, you have the skills, you might get the chance to, you know, go back and remediate one or two things. If you keep teaching with inaccessible materials, over time, go back and fix them as time goes by. But it's not something that we expect to happen overnight. Um, there still will be issues where you have um, a student who has a disability and you need to accommodate them and you need to put the sign on the edge of the door saying, okay, well, you go over here. That might still happen um, in your course until you get the rest of the way there. And that's okay because you're aware and you're working on it. So from the university's perspective, that's kind of where we'd like to support people in getting to. Um, so I like to start with looking at the syllabus because in a lot of ways it's the doorstep, right? It's the front, front facing document that welcomes students to the course. Um, and so if you're going to try out some universal design, let's start with your syllabus. Yes, you can do universal design to a syllabus. It's like, wow, yeah, it could happen. Um, so we're going to look about, at what that means. Hopefully in this workshop, um, this is sort of the interactive, fun part of the workshop in my mind, uh, where we can actually look at some examples that I brought and kind of talk through some of these ideas. Hopefully you'll have some aha moments of like, oh, that makes sense, and oh, that's not that hard. I could totally do this. Um, I have a template for creating a universally designed syllabus, and I also have a checklist. So at the end of all of this, 
you can use those two materials however best you see fit to ensure that all of your syllabi from next semester on out um, exhibit universal design. Um, so, uh, does anyone here have their own syllabus that they might look at? Go ahead and open it up and just pull it up on your computer. For those of you who are watching this remotely and after the fact, these materials are available on the accessibility website, and so you can get them there or contact myself or a page and you can have access to those materials as well. Um, but hopefully you are having access to them and following along.
include pictures, you know, like mm -hmm. all this is required a lot of uh, familiarity with the internet, you know, with the computer tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of things are implied or assumed yeah. without any kind of clarification on you know, even where you go to get more information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what else? Are we supposed to read one of these books Yeah, I mean it's true that the workload may be uh, potentially troublesome for some people. If you can't count line, you will have trouble with reading red. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And part of the problem there is to say, well, the assignments in red must be done. And the assignments in green are strongly recommended. And if you're colorblind, you have no idea which ones are red and that you must do, and which ones are green and that you're just suggested to do. And what does suggested to do even mean? <laughs> So that's a little bit of a problem as well. It's just a lack of clarity. Okay. Yeah. Any other ideas about what's been going wrong in here? We look ahead of time. Did you already know? I've been trying. But the first time I looked at it, I thought, it's not great, but I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's not horrible. But mm -hmm. then again, I didn't really know what I was looking for. Right. And kind of understanding that it's it's about form and content mm -hmm. going together. So the fact that there are no headers, that yeah. you know there are no dates for the weeks, and mm -hmm. you know, as a student I would count dates. Um, mm -hmm. It implies that you have the wherewithal to look up the titles of the books. Like, what if you never heard of Harry Potter? <laughs> it, this could be a really kind of unuseful directive to just, well, go find them. It's like, have I found the right ones? You know, hopefully your, your students don't end up, you know, spending a lot of time reading fan fiction on the internet instead of finding the correct book. Because um, we don't have titles or ISBN numbers. Um, the due dates are unclear. Yeah, so there's several things. Um, So, is it like the font an issue as well? Like, I'm, I'm not sure which font this is, but uh, I, I am sure that this makes it people have some, some, some issue that there are certain fonts that are much better than others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, this particular font is not terrible. A lot mm -hmm. of dyslexic readers have found that sensory font, so this is Calibri and it's a sensory font that they tend to be more reader-friendly than um, serif fonts, like um, Time to Roman, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes those are a little bit harder for dyslexic readers. Ironically, a lot of those fonts that have been created for dyslexic people mm -hmm. um, aren't very helpful mm -hmm. in, in a lot of usability tests with dyslexic readers. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's just sort of ironic that you know it may just be a, a, a gimmick, a selling gimmick, that somebody has created this type of font that's supposedly better for dyslexic readers, but that's not always the case. Um, but yeah, I think so I, I, I worked in a, in a center where I had to produce all my documents in the time of the The standard? Yes. Right, right. And also the size of larger font. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, first of all, I would never suggest that you either only give a paper copy or a digital copy to a student, if possible, give them both, um, because students who do require some magnification to see things clearly, they know what those tools are and they can use them as they need to, as long as they have that digital copy. So whatever you give them, the exact same thing should be readily available, maybe as D2L content and as a Microsoft Word download that they can grab and use however they need to. Um, but having some multiple ways of accessing this information and this document is also important for students. Um, but yeah, to go over this 
in class. Um, a lot of people just hand out the syllabus on the first day. But if you actually take a moment and sort of do a tour of the syllabus, for students who do have that dyslexia, um, hearing it read aloud as they're looking at it is actually one of the most useful things that you can do for that person. Um, because hearing it read aloud forces them to really look at each word as it's being read and will help th with the absorption of that information. Um, so a couple of other things that aren't working so well. Um, and we each knows this because we've talked about it, but um, there's no formatting, there's no style sheet that's part of this document. We'll talk about what that means, but um, at a glance, it's kind of hard to see what's what um, and where the information is divided up. Um, grades are in a table, as is the schedule for that matter. Um, so a couple of tables are being used, and as we'll talk about, tables are sometimes problematic for screen readers sometimes really hard for a screen reader because of the way that it navigates down. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're sighted, you can just sort of use it like a grid and go over or down as you need to, but a screen reader reads everything across the screen and then goes down and across and down and across and down and across. And so if you need to figure out um, what a piece of information is, that's sort of down in the middle and the bottom of the table, if it's a much longer table than this, obviously. Um, unless you're repeating your headings of your table later on, it can sometimes be very confusing. Like, wait, what, what did that number relate to? I don't remember, because I'm not able to just look up the column and see what's at the top. Um, so it can be prob problematic for people. Yeah, and is it the same for tables without borders? If you're using a table to format it in the document, that's what is going to create the problem. With. So I'm fixing my syllabus. It's, it's, <laughs> it's also a syllabus in transition, so that's uh -huh. more of a mess. How would you format rubrics? So uh, they tend to be formatted in, in, in tables. tables. Mm -hmm. um, that's an excellent question. question. Yeah, so let's talk about that later. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's an excellent question that maybe we can return to towards the end. Um, we talked about the color coding for differentiation. Um, only one method of communication is sort of um, implied in terms of how best to get a hold of the professor. Um, ideally, people have different preferences in how they talk and communicate with each other. So if you can provide a phone number, do. You're a human being. Hopefully we can find you if we need to talk to you. Um, so that's something that for certain students who have anxiety disorders that it's comforting to know that they can call and actually speak to somebody and have that human connection as well. Um, okay, so that's this syllabus. Now what if, what if we talked to Dr. Simpson? By the way, you guys notice that Bart Simpson is teaching this class? No. <laughs> It's mostly to entertain myself. So if we talk to Dr. Simpson and we say, look, can you flesh this out a little bit more? Can you give us some more information? Dr. Simpson goes away and comes back with this version of the syllabus. Okay. Now you already know the secret. It's still inaccessible. So take a look at this one and see if you can tell what can still be improved. Can you put in numbers on the, because here there, you have the seven books, but you don't actually have the order of the books, so you might want to put numbers, so you have the first volume that goes in the other syllabus. Mm -hmm. So read 
gotten that information. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, having that redundancy built in. Some things haven't changed, right? We're still seeing tables. We're still seeing some things that are potentially a little confusing. So I hear that the sentence gets in touch with them, with the category of your information on the CU disability and get in touch with them rather than with the professor. Right, right. So, but then, so then you receive a letter that you know, then you have to be aware and you have to sign them so that you are aware that you are receiving it for some of the class. Yeah, and, and just not really providing um, the, you know, then the onus is on the student to Google this or navigate mm -hmm. through the CU website to find that, that resource. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas if you're formatting this in a digital environment, which you are, because you're typing it on a computer, um, embed a couple of hyperlinks. I mean, students will see that it's underlined there, and they know what a hyperlink looks like. Print it out. Embed a few hyperlinks so that they can click and go straight to the Disability Services website. Um, that's what all of our CU accommodation statements that are recommended do. They have that contact information built in so that it's easy for a user to um, quickly find that info. And it's about reducing barriers to info. That's what we're looking for here. Yeah. And yeah, there are a couple things in the language that are maybe less friendly. <laughs> um, While it is um, specified that um, there all are alternative formats um, on the first page, it says, well, audiobooks are available, but you should read the text as it's written to fully appreciate the nuances of the stories. Um, it's all well and good that you can't actually see words on the printed page. You do what you can do, right? Um, so when a professor includes their own bias in their language, um, it, it kind of helps to create a potentially unfriendly tone for some students. So just something to be aware of, you know, try not to reveal your own biases um, in terms of the art that is your class. <laughs> because, it, you know, it could have unintended implications. So things that are still going on here in this. Um, so it's not using a style sheet, but it looks there's things in bold. I can find the info, you say. Yep, that's true. And for the most part, unless you know what you're looking for, you won't necessarily know if it's a style sheet or not until I show you, and then you'll know what to look for. Um, Style sheets, it's sort of the equivalent of if you're reading a book on a Kindle and there are no chapters, you have to skim through the entire thing and look at every single one of those words again until you get to chapter five where you left off. Um, it's sort of the equivalent of doing the same thing here. If you have a long document and a screen reader is trying to parse that document, if you don't have any tags or headings, basically, that help break up that information in terms of how the technology reads it, it's like skimming the entire, it, re it will read every single word 
it makes it very difficult to jump ahead to find exactly where you need to be. So if the student is just trying to get back to the course calendar to double check when an assignment is due, they don't want to have to have the experience of reading all of this again. Um, they will because they're a student in your course and they're dealing with what it's like to have an inaccessible syllabus with a professor who's probably well-meaning but just doesn't know. Um, but now that you'll know, it's actually easy um, to make these documents accessible. Um, course technologies do not explain me too well. So again, with the consistency and clarity of information, we'll kind of talk more about that. And the accommodation statement, as you said, it doesn't provide any contact info. So we don't know where we're going or who you're supposed to be getting in touch with. So there are other things in here that we kind of pack. But at the same time, da -da -da -da, the big reveal, here's what the accessible version of this syllabus looks like. It's a little bit of a heftier document, you'll notice, because all of the university recommended syllabus statements are included. Um, you know, this isn't a fight that I'm willing to, it's not a battle that I'm willing to die for, if, you know, if you are really against including all of those. It's kind of up to you, ultimately. They're university recommended, not university mandated. So if you're really anti-long syllabus and you don't want to have them there, okay. Um, I think enough students by now are used to seeing them that they don't really mind. They're kind of okay and kind of used to the syllabus being a longer document. It's just sort of normal in terms of what they're experiencing. So including them is potentially useful for them, um, even though it's a couple more pages. So what are we seeing here? Anything that's jumping out at you that is like, oh, oh, that's interesting. I would not have thought of that. That's cool. Why is that there? Things that are here that weren't in the other versions? Was that in the style sheet? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have this, this different font shift. It's still a, a sensory font, which is supposedly much friendlier for dyslexic readers. Um, but this is a using a style sheet that is one of the defaults in Microsoft Word. Um, and within a few keystrokes, I was able to format this document and create it this way. Um, it was super fast and pretty easy. And if I do say so myself, it's kind of an aesthetically pleasing document. You know, it's pretty easy to read, looks pretty professional, nice. Cool. Mm -hmm. We have a footer, so, you know, again, yeah, page numbers. Again, it's just little things that make life a little easier if you're shockingly like disorganized student. <gasps> Would they be disorganized? Could this ever be ripped apart and come into multiple pieces? <laughs> yes, it probably could in their backpack or folder or wherever. Um, they still know what, it, what the piece of paper they're looking at is and where it goes. Um, so those, with, those are what those tags are for. Um, we're still using some color to, to signify change here, but um, now the colors are closer together on the color wheel, and so they shouldn't um, produce any ill effects for persons who are colorblind. Um, and um, We've added language at the end of those statements so that color is not the only thing that, um, that sort of, oh, so um, like on page three, things are marked in red and in purple. And when they appear in the schedule, things are in red and in purple and it clarifies what that means. So there's that redundancy of, yes, this is mandatory, this is strongly recommended. Um, my own personal pet peeve, even though this is a, an accessible syllabus, it doesn't clarify that, so 
So as a teaching problem, that might be a different conversation that I would have with you to say, well, what do you mean by strongly recommended? <laughs> that doesn't necessarily make it super clear for a student. There are things that might still be unclear in how you teach your class, but you could have a really accessible, universally designed syllabus. So it's not a magic wand, it's not going to fix everything. There are things that still need to happen in the actual pedagogy, but in terms of clarity of the document, it's still working. And all the recommendations in the languages of references, these are actually things that are required. We have to put them in our, I mean, I don't teach on a regular basis, but mm -hmm. I do get the emails saying, by the way, don't forget to include those things. And yeah. I think, so I think most people have They come out of Mike Grant's office, and the way that they're phrased is that they're, they're university recommended syllabus statements. I don't know. Uh, I, yeah. But usually people re include them anyway, which is wonderful. I have had some faculty who have provided pushback on this and tried to really create the case for the short syllabus and okay, that's fine, just, you know, you know, at least then you're making a conscious choice about what you're doing with your syllabus. And that's mainly what I want you to have the information to, to be able to do that. Um, the problem with the problem is not so much the length is the, the, the clarity when there are too many cross-references in a, whether it's a long syllabus or a short syllabus, you know, so in order to understand this thing, you have to go to that, uh, this page and then go back to the other page, you have this other page. So mm -hmm.